Tonight on Why New. The Department of Education suffers 7 billion pesos of budget cut allocated to construction of new classrooms. Rehabilitation of some of Baguio City's tourist traps to start this year, but local government denies total closure. The National Water Resources Board increases water allocation in Metro Manila, less water service interruptions to be expected. Quezon City Government starts implementation of ban against single-use plastics in supermarkets this month. AFP Cavaliers, DENR Warriors to battle for semi-final round top spot in the UNTV Cup Season 8. Good evening. The country's education department assures better quality of education will be provided to Filipino students this year. This is despite the cut in the budget for classroom construction. Joan Nano tells us why. The overall approved budget of the Department of Education for 2020 has increased by more than 2 billion pesos from that in 2019. However, the fund allotted for the supposed construction of new classrooms has been reduced by 7 billion pesos. Of the proposed 19 billion peso budget, President Rodrigo Duterte approved only 12 billion pesos. The Education Department explains the cut in the budget for classroom construction was realigned to other DepEd programs. Those include programs for human resource development, wherein teachers will undergo intensive training to enhance their teaching strategies. DepEd Undersecretary for Finance Anilin Sevilla explains, despite the budget reduction for the construction of new classrooms this year, DepEd has several alternative methods to assure they will provide quality education to Filipino students through advanced technologies, additional learning materials, and class schedule adjustments. For example, which we do not want to happen but might happen, especially in Metro Manila in urban areas, shifting. I yun nga lang, kailangan ko na mas maraming teacher. Dahil dalawang shifting to, hindi po pwedeng the same teacher, mapapagod si teacher. Ano? At doon maapektuhan ang quality. This year, DepEd will hire about 10,000 more teachers and 5,000 additional non-teaching personnel. The government has funds allotted for such measure. The budget cut does not include the budget for the renovation of classrooms devastated by the previous calamities. But budget increases can be seen in some of DepEd's programs. These include the voucher program for senior high school, school-based feeding programs, and Sulong Edukalidad. Kailangan ituloy natin ang pagbibigay ng kaalaman, pagbibigay ng mga uh, weapon or tools para sa mga guro na magkaroon ng mas karidad na edukasyon ng ating mga paaralan. It can be noted that Filipino students were reported in December 2019 as the poorest in reading comprehension globally. This is blamed on the poor quality of education in the country. John Lano, UNTV News and Rescue, Passing City. A better city of pines will soon surprise tourists and locals alike. But Baguio City will not be close to tourists, unlike Boracay. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. The city of Pines will undergo major rehabilitation this year. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources said today, Baguio City will not be close to tourists unlike what was done on Boracay. The Department of Tourism, the DENR, the Department of the Interior and Local Government, and the local government of Baguio have already met and came up with plans to renovate the city. DOT Secretary Bernadette Robolo Puyat said 480 million pesos will be allocated for the rehabilitation of the historic Burnham Park. Talagang pwede pa nating paganda at napansin ko nag-uusap nga kami City of Flowers ang Baguio. Dagdagan natin ng maraming bulaklak. Pagandahin natin yung mismong yung, yung talagang tourist attraction siya. So talagang timely i-rehabilitate siya. DILG Secretary Eduardo Año commends Baguio Mayor Benjamin Magalong for seeking assistance from the national government for the rehabilitation, though he lamented the gradual deterioration of the popular North Luzon city. Such is attributed to the influx of tourists and the lack of action over the past years. Merong kapabayan. Makita natin yung water, no? Murky and masyadong malabo na. Uh, kung may mahulog dyan na pasahero o yung turista, oh. hindi natin alam kung baga biglang magkasakit na lang yan o oh, ano. So, for safety also, and uh, for wholesome entertainment, talagang timely ayusin na natin. 
The DILG secretary said he does not want Baguio to be called the highest smoky mountain of the Philippines. The DNR meanwhile said it will be providing technical support and assistance to come up with new ordinances to help Baguio become climate change resilient. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue. The National Water Resources Board or NWRB has increased the water allocation for Metro Manila. From the previous 40 cubic meters per second, it is now up to 42 cubic meters per second. This will shorten the hours, the water service interruptions being implemented by Manilad and Manila Water. Meanwhile, irrigation water allocation for farms in Bulacan and Pampanga has also been increased by 20 cubic meters per second. As of 6 a.m. today, the water level in Angat Dam slightly increased to 204.51 meters from yesterday's 204.40 meters. The Quezon City government vows to intensify its monitoring and coordination with supermarkets. This after several meat products in two supermarkets in the city have been found positive for African swine fever or ASF. Mayor Joy Belmonte met with representatives of supermarkets in Quezon City this morning to discuss protocols in ensuring that all of their meat products are ASF free. It also it was also agreed that supermarkets will identify the burial sites and shoulder the costs of disposal and disinfection procedures. Supermarkets that will be found illegally harboring ASF-infected products will also meet penalties as stipulated in the executive order. Persons deprived of liberty in a city jail in Laguna province receive treatment for some of their illnesses as UNTV and Members Church of God International visited them. A jail official says such visit and free services are just what the PDLs need. Sherwin Kulabong will tell us why. Over 100 persons deprived of liberty or PDL benefited from the medical mission brought to the Kalamba City Jail by UNTB and Members Church of God International or MCGI. One of them is Ruena, not her real name, who has been suffering from urinary tract infection and wounds in her feet. Natutuwa po ako kasi mapapagamot na ka. Maraming maraming salamat sa pagpunta niyo dito at kami nagagamot. Napakalaking tulong po sa amin ito. Kasi yung pong nabadamit din namin na abagamot. Maraming maraming salamat po kay Brother Eli. Kung hindi po namin sa kanya, hindi kami magagamot ng ganito. Aside from the free medical services, which included general and optical check-up and tooth extraction, UNTB and MCGI also provided free legal consultation, free haircut and free massage therapy. Even free eyeglasses were given to PDLs with poor eyesight. Mula kayo, malaking tulong po sa akin to dahil sa pagbabasa. Eh, malabo po ang mata ko pagka nagbabasa, hindi ko makikita yung malilit, malilit na letra. The Infirmary Head Officer of Calamba Bureau of Jail Management and Penology Jail Superintendent Elizabeth Garceron said the medication of PDLs must be monitored. The aim is for the PDLs to recover from their illnesses. Noong kalabarson na may uh, PDL infected people ang nasa ating pangalanan. So, pagka ganyan, pagka natapos ng gamutan, after 6 months to 1 year, conforme sa severity ng kanilang sakit, ibabalik ulit natin sa sakit after ng gamutan. A total of 167 PDLs in the Calamba City Jail took advantage of UNTB and MCGI's jail visit. Kaya maraming maraming salamat po sa UNTB Medical Mission at po doon sa coordinator ng aming dating daan. Napakalaking tulong po. Maraming maraming salamat sa pagpapahalaga sa PDLs kasi kailangan kayo ng Free medical missions and legal consultations are part of UNTB and MCGI's advocacy that good deeds bear no evil fruit. Sherwin Kulubong, UNTB News and Rescue, Calamba, Laguna. FB Cavaliers and DNR Warriors will battle on Sunday in UNTV Cup Season 8 as both teams await the semifinal round. Meanwhile, PITC Global Traders and Judiciary Magis will 
clash for the quarterfinals ranking. Bernard Dadis explains why. One of the much-awaited battles this season of the League of Public Servants will take place on Sunday as the second round eliminations of the tourney end. Three-time and defending champion AOP Cavaliers will battle rookie team DNR Warriors. The two teams, both with 7-1 win-loss records, have earned semi-finals ticket. Sunday's game will reveal which team will be number one. Cavaliers head coach Corporal Sunny Manukat assures his team will come prepared after a long vacation from their December 8 victory over Malacanang PSC Kabao. Kailangan wag namin pabayaan eh nandiyan na naman kami. Eh mahirap. Marami kami matutulungan ulit eh. Kaya sabi ko sa kanila nandito na tayo. Bigyan na natin lahat. Warriors key player Ralph Lansang will be back on the hard court after a three-game suspension. Coach Manukat said this game is important for them as they face a complete DNR roster. Actually, mas gusto namin yun. At least, eh, kung ano man mangyari sa next round, matetest na namin yung strength ng team nila. Papangako namin, magiging physical kami sa kanila. Magiging bilang AFP. The AFP DNR battle, the first time this season happens in the second game at 5 p.m. in Paco Arena, Manila. AFP. Meanwhile, in the first game at 3.30 p.m., the UN TV Cup crowd will witness the PITC Judiciary Clash. Both teams with 5-3 win-loss records qualify in the next round. Court Administrator Midas Marquez said, aside from a tight defense, they will also work on the player's stamina. So, talaga conditioning lang kailangan. Raiders, on the other hand, the only team that defeated the DNR Warriors will stick to their game plan and teamwork to defeat the two-time champ Magis. Ang panatin, uh, alam ko they're not a ano, they're a, a team to beat also. Uh, bibigyan namin sila magandang laban. And the only team that defeated the DNR Warriors will stick to their game plan and teamwork to defeat the two-time champs Magis. The Agriculture Food Masters and the NHA Builders made it to the quarterfinals, but Malacanang PSC Kabao and PhilHealth have been both eliminated. The quarterfinals begin on January 16, Thursday. NHA, DA, PITC, and Judiciary will battle in single round robin matches with ranking carryover. Bernard Dalis, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Welcome back to Y News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro the third left off. I'm Alex Balbazar and here are the headlines. Over 300 tons of garbage collected after Quiapo procession yesterday. 59 devotees face charges for violating city ordinances during Traslacion 2020. Soldiers tasked to assist in the repatriation of OFWs to depart for the Middle East anytime. Philippine National Police have persons of interest in the killing of former Congressman Edgar Mendoza and his two aides. And find out what's more important, quality or length of sleep. Good evening. Tons of garbage were collected by the authorities yesterday following the yearly procession in Gapo, Manila. Bernard Dadis tells us why. The bouts left behind more than 300 tons of garbage after the procession in Gapo, Manila City yesterday, according to the Manila Department of Public Services. This is equivalent to 68 truckloads of trash. According to authorities, this is a lot less than the rubbish collected last year's event which was more than 380 tons or 99 truckloads. According to DPS Chief Kenneth Amorau, the policies implemented by Manila Mayor Isko Moreno de Bagoso during the procession was a great factor in the production of less trash. This includes the zero vendor policy and strict implementation of the anti-littering law. 
A man identified as Ace Pareñas was arrested for violating the Vice Ordinance 1158 or the illegal disposal of garbage. He was caught last night dumping several sacks of trash in Escolta Street, Barangay 303, Santa Cruz. Aside from Pareñas, 12 other individuals were arrested in Rojas Boulevard, Corner South Drive, Ermita because of obstruction, illegal vending, and littering. Burger Daddy's UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The National Capital Region Police Office files charges against more than 50 devotees after yesterday's procession in Capo, Manila. Meanwhile, police are looking into an incident that involves a police official who grabbed the mobile phone of a journalist during the traslacion. Leia Ilaga tells us why. Fifty-nine devotees are now facing charges for violating city ordinances during the translation yesterday. National Capital Region Police Office Acting Director, Police Brigadier General De Boltina says those devotees were arrested because of drinking liquor and bringing bladed and pointed weapons. But Sinas adds they did not file cases against the devotees who throw urine placed inside mineral water bottles. Yung nambabato kasi sa amin, uh, hindi na na-identify. Yung nagkuha ng portalet kasi nung pinuntahan ng mga kasama namin, nagtatakbuhan na. In fact, meron pa nga doon yung iba, yung mga ihi natin yung pinagtatapon. Eh. But just the same, restraints was there. At uh, ito mga tolerance talaga din. Pero alam mo, hindi ko ma-describe kung anong klaseng mga deboto to. Uh, kung deboto talaga sila. The NCRPO Acting Director also says they are looking into the actions of some devotees who stepped on NCRPO mobile patrol vehicles. Meanwhile, SPD Director Police Brigadier General Nolasco Batan will not be relieved from his post although the incident he was involved in is now being investigated by the Regional Internal Affairs Service. Batan is not the cellular phone of GMA reporter Jun Veneracion during the commotion between the devotees and policemen on the Ayala Bridge. No, it's not. Because Jun Amangkwan was a part of this uh, performance of functions. But Han argued he did not recognize Veneracion and thought the reporter was a threat so he grabbed the journalist's phone. But Han has apologized to the reporter. I would like to apologize for what happened at Ayala Bridge during the procession of the Black Tassarine 2020 wherein I confiscated the cell phone, cellular phone of a media personality who was later on identified as Mr. Jun Benaracion of GMA7, thinking that he was someone who possessed threat during the procession. Sina says they will wait for the recommendation of Regional Internal Affairs Service, National Capital Region, before coming up with a decision on Batan's action. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Department of Transportation reported it has finished the replacement of rails in some parts of the MRT-3 tracks. This effort is part of the MRT-3 rehabilitation project. The rail replacement includes the southbound lane of Buendia to Taft Avenue Station and the northbound lane of Buendia to Magallanes Station. Next to be replaced are the rails between Magallanes and Taft Avenue Stations. The DOTR expects the rail replacement to be completed in February next year. Three major airline companies in the Philippines pledge to assist the government in the repatriation of the overseas Filipino workers in the countries affected by the tension between the United States and Iran. Through the Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines, Cebu Pacific and the Philippine Airlines have expressed willingness to assist in flying back to the Philippines stranded Filipinos in the United Arab Emirates. Air Asia promises to transport the OFWs from Manila to their provinces. The airline companies say they are also willing to lend the necessary air assets needed in the the government's repatriation efforts.
Police investigation in the slaying of a former Solon in Kazan and his two aides is progressing. The PNP will conduct DNA tests on their charred bodies through their families have identified the remains. In a separate incident in Pangasinan, police continue to investigate the motive behind the crime. The Philippine National Police confirmed they are looking into possible persons of interest in the killing of three victims found burned inside a car in Tiang, Quezon last Wednesday, January 8. The victims' relatives have identified the identities of the bodies as former Batangas 2nd District Representative Edgar Mendoza and his two aides. PNP spokesperson, Police Brigadier General Bernard Banak says the police want to find out who were the people the ex salon met with in Calamba, Laguna before the bodies were found charred? Nagtatag na ng uh, Special Investigation Task Group ang uh, pamunuan ng Region 4A sa pangunguna ni Police Brigadier General Vic Canau. At uh, kasalukuyan ay may mga tinitignan sila ng mga possible uh, persons of interest uh, para sa garang kalulutas ng uh, krimen. General Banak adds, although the victims' families have identified the bodies, the PNP will still need to conduct a DNA test on the remains as part of their standard operating procedures. Uh, usually, ay tumatagal ito ng tatlong araw hanggang isang linggo. At uh, kukuha pa tayo ng mga samples na pagkukumparahan. No? Sumari ay uh, tayo mag ng isang uh, membro ng pamilya upang uh, makapagbigay ng uh, sample. Meanwhile, the PNP are also conducting an investigation on the killing of retired Brigadier General Marlo Chan in Kalasyao, Pangasinan. They are looking at all angles including his previous job as a police officer and provincial director of Pangasinan in 2013. He retired from the service last year. Kapag tayo sa servisyo ay may mga posibilidad na may mga uh, nasagasaan tayo mga criminal groups or syndicates na maring uh, may uh, pinanin na uh, sama ng loob or galit sa ating mga uh, pinuno. Uh, kaya uh, nung ito ay magretiro ay marahil ay uh, uh, isa to sa mga dahilan. The retired general and his driver Juanito Lozada Jr. were ambushed by gunmen at about 3 p.m. yesterday. Chan was hit in the neck, chest and other body parts. He was brought to the nearest hospital but was declared dead on arrival. His driver survived the incident. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue, come Krami. A group of Filipino soldiers from three major services of the armed forces of the Philippines will head for the Middle East any time to carry out the government's order to repatriate Filipinos. Down the Amento tells us why. Task Force Paguli will soon leave for the Middle East. Their task to help in bringing Filipinos back home to the Philippines. The task force consists of two battalions consisting of Philippine Marine Corps and Philippine Army personnel plus Philippine Air Force troopers. A three-star general from the Armed Forces of the Philippines will command the group. AFP spokesperson Brigadier General Edgar Arevalo says Task Force Paguli are ready to depart any time for the planned repatriation of Filipinos affected by the tensions between America and Iran. Two Navy ships will be used including the BRP Davao del Sur with 500 capacity. Their escort is a new frigate of the naval fleet. The Philippine Air Force will utilize their two C-130 and one C-295 planes. This is a so-called non-combatant evacuation operation na gagawin natin. Uh, wala pa tayong naging ganitong uh, operations in the past. The AFP ad, a platoon of a medical team, will join the group to attend to the medical needs of OFWs in Middle East. They have a complete supply of medicines and other medical equipment. The soldiers will carry hazard medical equipment with them in preparation for any possible chemical attack. We are aware of the challenges that we are facing, lalong lalo na yung distansya na lalakbay natin. Mangailangan tayo ng several instances of refueling at saka resupply ng ating mga logistical requirements. The AFP clarify their soldiers are armed but they will leave those weapons inside a ship once they arrive at their destination as their mission is a rescue operation and not a combat operation. Should the situation become hostile, the contingents will seek diplomatic clearance from the host country to carry their firearms. As of the moment, a forced repatriation is implemented only for Filipinos in Iraq.
dan Demento UNTV News and Rescue Camp Aguinaldo. Shoppers and consumers in Quezon City, you may want to make it a habit to bring with you your recyclable bags when you go grocery shopping beginning this month. Harleen Delgado tells us why. Single-use plastics will be banned in several establishments in Quezon City this month. First to be banned are plastic bags in supermarkets. Such measure is in accordance with the amendment of the 2012 Plastic Bag Reduction Ordinance, which states that customers can avail of a plastic bag worth 2 pesos for their purchased items. Some supermarkets in the city have been seen obeying the ordinance. Even mall supermarkets have announced their compliance. According to the Kazan City Environmental Protection and Waste Management Department, the ban is expected to greatly reduce the city's waste production. Kazan City collects one 10-wheeler dump truck full of waste plastic bags and one mini dump truck full of single-use plastics daily. So, so if we multiply that sa, in a year, 365 10-wheeler dump trucks and 365 mini dump trucks, kung ma-reduce natin yun, significant na yung magiging contribution niya para mabuwasan yung waste generation natin, lalo na sa plastic. And within two years, paper bags will also be removed to encourage buyers to always bring their own recyclable bags. Kasi yung iba, tapon lang ng tapon. Yung mga hindi nila nire-recycle, yung dapat i-recycle. Mas okay kasi yung basura natin hindi magbara. Tama yun dahil yung iba nasa basurahan, yun ang sinisimulaan ng baha. Pag plastic talaga yung mga kan, yun na minsan natatapo na, yun ang sinisimulaan ng mag mabarakanal. But according to Philippine Amalgamated Supermarkets Association, their members are not yet ready to fully enforce the ban. The group's president, Stephen Kua, says they were not even properly informed that the plastic ban begins this month. Uh, question mark as to how to do it. How do you sell to someone? Carton? Maubos ang carton. Di ba? Oh, we're committed. We're committed to comply as long as there's a way. Right now, everybody's asking, "How do we do it, Steve?" But according to Kazan City Mayor Joy Belmonte, business owners were given enough time to transition since October when the ordinance was signed. Belmonte also clarified, plastic labo is not included in the ban as it is needed to wrap fresh and raw food items such as fish and meat products. Uh, with Mr. Kua's statement, uh, obviously, may pagkukulang pa kami and, uh, and I will uh, press them for uh, a more intensified information dissemination campaign. In February, single-use plastics in fast food restaurants, hotels, and other establishments will be prohibited. These include disposable spoon and forks, plastic cups, straws, coffee stirrers, packets of condiments and toiletries, among others. However, these are prohibited only during dine-ins and are still allowed for takeouts. Belmonte adds the move will significantly help in the city's garbage segregation efforts. Well, I think we have established about 64%, more than 50% definitely, um, segregation um, success rate natin. At tingin ko malaking kabawasan na doon sa tiyatapo natin sa landfill dahil wala na tayong landfill dito sa Lungsod Quezon. Violators will face corresponding fines with 1,000 pesos for the first offense, 3,000 pesos for second offense, along with cancellation of environmental clearance certificates and issuance of cease and deceased order, and 5,000 pesos for the third offense with revocation of business permit and closure order. The Quezon City Government will deputize some of their employees in the Environment Protection and Waste Management Department, village officials, and select members of the private sector to inspect and monitor the establishment. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue, Kazan City. Welcome back to Wine News. A new boat that costs millions of pesos will soon serve passengers who patronize the Pasig River ferry system. If you are up for a comfortable Pasig River trip, just for an experience or for your daily commute, head for ferry stations between Guadalupe and Escolta. Dante Amento will tell us why. A test run of the newly acquired ferry boat of the Pasig River ferry service was conducted today. A 50 capacity, air-conditioned, Wi-Fi access and comfort rooms. These are just some of the special features the 30 million pesos new ferry boat can offer per passengers. It was donated by the D2 Telecommunity. 
It is locally made by Nautical Transport Service Incorporated. It can travel from 8 to 24 knots or 23 kilometers per hour. From Guadalupe Station up to the Escolta Station, it will just take one and a half hour. This is 30 minutes shorter than when using old Passive River ferry boats. The new boat will travel four to five times a day. Well, we're providing a good alternate uh, transport system for them and with an average of a thousand passengers per day. It's a big help already for these uh, individuals or passengers. That, you know. The boat will be fully operational next month. We want Pasig River to be a source of transportation, you know, a form of transportation. Pangalawa, for tourism purposes. Pangatlo, kung nakikita ng mga tao na ginagamit ito, siguro magsisimula na sila mag-isip na hindi nagdumihan. You know? Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue, Makati City. The Department of Transportation is furious over new petition filed by Ride Hailing Service Angkas against the government's guidelines on the operation of motorcycle taxis. The petition filed before the Quezon City Regional Trial Court Branch 223 requests for a temporary restraining order on putting a cap on the number of motorcycle taxis. Angkas also wants the court to issue an order preventing ride hailing companies Joyride and Move It to join the pilot pilot test run. The Transportation Department says Angkas is not ready to release its monopolistic hold on the motorcycle ride-hailing service sector. For the first time, Japanese Prime Minister Motegi Toshimitsu visits the Philippines. He paid a courtesy call to President Rodrigo Duterte in Malacanang yesterday. During their meeting, President Rodrigo Duterte expressed his gratitude for Japan's continued support to the country's development programs. The Japanese Foreign Minister pointed out that ties between the Philippines and Japan have entered the golden age under President Duterte. Motegi also expressed his sympathies to the survivors of the recent calamities that hit the country. Malacanang slams the Senate of the United States of America for approving a resolution calling for the release of detained Senator Lila de Lima. But a U.S. Senator says he will not be silenced by the Philippine government. Rosalie Cos explains why. Though Malacanang says it continues to respect the Senate of the United States of America, it finds some of the U.S. Senators misguided. The palace reacts to Senate Resolution 142 in the U.S. introduced by Democrat Senator Edward Markey, who condemns the Philippine government for the continuing detention of Senator Leila de Lima. Markey is the third U.S. Senator banned to enter the Philippines. The two others are U.S. Senators Dick Durbin and Patrick Leahy. According to Markey, he will not be silenced by the Philippine government. The resolution calls on U.S. President Donald Trump to impose sanctions on Philippine government officials behind the Lima's detention, as well as those involved in alleged extrajudicial killings. This is in accordance with the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act, which authorizes the U.S. government to sanction those who it sees as rights offenders and human rights violators and freeze their assets. Such is also the content of the speech of Senator Durbin on the Senate floor recently. The Duterte regime should stop threatening the travel of Filipino Americans and so many others who travel between our nations and instead assure a quick and credible trial for Senator de Lima or simply do the right thing and release her. The U.S. Senate passed this resolution on Thursday according to the official website of the United States Congress. However, Malacanang is disappointed over the Senate resolution and describes this as a clear interference with the country's sovereignty. The Duterte administration has been insisting that the arrest and detention of the Lima is lawful and it is the court which determined the probable cause on her drug-related cases. Yung mga statements na ganyan at mga resolutions na ganyan, uh, we deem it to be pangingialam. Uh, parang dinidiktahan tayo uh, dun sa kung paanong patakbuhin ang justice system natin. Eh, independent tayo eh. Uh, sovereign state tayo. So, don't, don't meddle in our sovereignty. 
Presidential Spokesperson and Chief Presidential Legal Counsel Salvador Panelo says the administration still trusts the agents of the U.S. government's executive branch, who he describes as more discerning and circumspect, and will act in accordance with credible information and supporting evidence. U.S. President Donald Trump has warned 20 days to act on the resolution passed by the U.S. Senators. Meanwhile, the Lima thanks the U.S. Senators for defending her. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. Massive climate protests are held in various parts of Australia against Prime Minister Scott Morrison and climate change. Rallyists call for Morrison to step down. Abel Siliani reports why. Despite the request of authorities in Australia, protesters still went ahead with their scheduled demonstrations against Prime Minister Scott Morrison to appeal for Morrison to step down from his position due to alleged lack of action to resolve the problem regarding the devastating bushfire in the country. Police staff were first to make their plea to the protesters to postpone their nationwide movement today. This as their attentions will be divided between ensuring the security of the locations where protests are happening and assisting with the battle against the bushfires. The strikes are also expected to cause heavy traffic. Demonstrations were held not only in Sydney but also in Perth, Brisbane and Melbourne. The rain in Melbourne did not stop the residents and students from proceeding with their protests. More than 30,000 rallies signified to join today's demonstrations online. The demonstrators appealed for firefighters to be given proper compensation, help the affected communities, and stop the use of fossil fuel. They also made an appeal for Prime Minister Morrison to step down due to alleged lack of action on climate crisis. We're going to set the Prime Minister! And here we are, Australia is burning, while our country, our leaders, uh, decide to spend billions and billions of dollars on weapons to fight wars on America's behalf. So I'm here today to stand with others who see the climate emergency as, as an important um, thing for our people to address. The organizers assured to keep the peace and security among the protesters. Nonetheless, they promised this would not be the first and last climate crisis protest. Abel Ziliano, UNTV News and Rescue, Australia. And for the news abroad, here's Stephanie C. reporting live from Hong Kong. Steph, good evening. Good evening, Alex. The United States government justifies to the United Nations its airstrike against Iran, which led to the death of top Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. In a speech this week, U.S. President Donald Trump said America is ready to embrace peace. Mirasol Abogadil tells us why necessary to protect United States personnel and interests. This is how United States representative to the United Nations Security Council Kelly Kraft justified U.S. airstrikes against Iran, which led to the death of Iran's top general Qasem Soleimani. The U.S. official said the action was an act of legitimate defense recognized under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. President Trump's decision was in direct response to an escalating series of armed attacks in recent months by Iran and Iranian-supported militias on U.S. forces and interest in the region. President Trump has made clear that his highest and most solemn duty is the defense of our nation and its citizens. While the U.S. is prepared to take additional actions in the region to defend its citizens, Ambassador Kraft said the United States also stands ready to engage without preconditions in serious negotiations with Iran. This is to prevent further endangerment of international peace and security or escalation by the Iranian regime. In his speech from the White House on Wednesday, Trump said the U.S. is ready to embrace peace and suggested that the 2015 nuclear deal, Trump's withdrawal from which in 2018 was a prelude to the current crisis, be renegotiated. At the same time, he announced powerful new sanctions on Tehran. The Iranian ambassador to the United Nations, Majid Takhravanchi, on Thursday said Iran would not be fooled by Trump's statements, which were both conciliatory and threatening. 
UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres on Thursday launched a call for peace to the political agitations that have come with the new year. War is never inevitable. It is a matter of choice. And often, it is the product of easy miscalculations. And peace too is never inevitable. It is the product of hard work, and we must never take it for granted. Mirasol Abugadil, UNTV News and Rescue. A Ukrainian airliner that crashed in Iran, killing all 176 people aboard, was likely brought down by an Iranian missile, according to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, citing intelligence from Canadian and other sources. Aiko Miguel reports. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau vowed that his government would not press until it had all the answers about the destruction of a Ukrainian airliner, which he said was hit by an Iranian missile. All 176 people on board, including 63 Canadians, were killed on Wednesday, shortly after the Boeing 737-800 jet took off from Tehran on a flight to Kiev. The crash is one of the most deadly disasters in recent Canadian history. Trudeau said Canada had intelligence from multiple sources indicating the plane had been shot down by an Iranian surface-to-air missile, quite possibly by accident. Iran denies its forces brought down the plane. The incident happened hours after Iran fired ballistic missiles at U.S. targets in Iraq and Iranians were on high alert for a U.S. military response. Canada has not had diplomatic relations with Iran since 2012, making its participation in the investigation a challenge. Trudeau said he spoke earlier to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who told him that Iran would allow investigators from Kyiv access to the plane's block boxes, which Tehran has said would not be allowed out of the country. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. Brexit is now unstoppable, but Britain must face up to how long it will take. Meanwhile, hundreds of students in India demand action from the government on a university attack. Jovic Burmas will tell us why. In the United Kingdom, the House of Commons has voted overwhelmingly in favor of Prime Minister Boris Johnson's Brexit deal, finally paving the way for the UK to leave the European Union later this month after more than 40 years of membership. The vote in the House of Commons is not quite the final parliamentary moment of Britain's Brexit story. The bill will be considered next by the unelected second chamber, the House of Lords. The bill was approved on a vote of 330 to 231. Johnson is now poised to take his country out of the EU on January 31st, about 10 months after it was originally scheduled to. In Morocco, Leading Moroccan human rights activists warn of an assault on freedom of expression in the country following the arrest of 15 journalists, bloggers, rappers and social media users in recent months. Protesters in front of the parliament in Rabat demand their release. The protest comes after the publication of a report by the National Solidarity Committee which sought to chronicle how authorities across the North African country increasingly clamped down on dissent during 2019, particularly on social media, which is widely considered to be the last remaining forum for Moroccans to speak freely. Those arrested are either facing charges, on trial or have been convicted for crimes varying from insulting the king or institutions to posting the lyrics of a popular rap song called Long Live the People, whose singer is spending one year in prison. And in India, Hundreds of students and professors from Jawaharlal Nehru University or JNU demonstrated on Thursday in New Delhi to demand the Indian government act against those who perpetrated an attack on the institution last Sunday, leaving at least 31 injured. The JNU students demand the removal of Vice Chancellor M. Jagadish Kumar. Meanwhile, Delhi police said it had zeroed in on a few suspects behind the attack. A senior police officer said they had identified at least 70 administrators of two WhatsApp groups, where the attack on members of the JNUSU was allegedly planned. 
At least 14 complaints have been received by Delhi police in connection with January 5th violence inside the JNU campus. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Stephanie C. reporting live from Hong Kong. What's more important for you, the quality of your sleep or the length of it? Well, a Filipino psychiatrist says the answer to that question is quality. Let's find out why from Ross Lee Cause. Do you lack sleep or do you always feel sleepy? A study shows that the Philippines is among the worst countries for average hours of sleep. The Sleep Cycle Data Survey says Filipinos have an average of only six and a half hours of sleep, while New Zealanders stay longer in their beds with seven and a half hours of sleep. Well, I think we do a lot more physical activity during the day, so at the end of the day we come home and we're ready to sleep, rather than feeling restless during night and not being able to sleep. New Zealand, together with other developed countries such as the Netherlands, Finland, Australia, UK and Belgium all rank high for sleep. Japan, on the other hand, another developed nation, has the worst problem in sleeplessness, with an average of only six hours of sleep, less than how much Filipinos sleep in average. This is why sleeping on the job has become part of the office life for many Japanese employees. But according to the Filipino psychiatrist Dr. Rainer Umali, the number of average hours of sleep is not what is important, but the quality of sleep. Very uh, subjective, you end up sleep, you know? but it's important is the quality of sleep. Not only on the length of time of sleep, but on the quality. Kahit na 12 hours ang tulog mo, but upon waking up, ikaw, you feel lousy. That is a good sleep. Babies, toddlers, and early adults should have eight or more hours of sleep every day. And as a person gets older, the length of sleep varies. Some symptoms of poor quality of sleep are irritability, moodiness, difficulty in learning new concepts, lack of concentration, and forgetfulness. Sleeplessness can also lead to other health conditions such as high blood pressure, stomach ache, muscle weakness, and other illness. Marami mga uh, bodily function problem na mangyayari siya because of lack of sleep and neurological uh, problems. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. Residents of idyllic Alpine town Hallstatt plan to limit tourist arrivals beginning May this year. Even the number of buses visiting the town will be restricted to only 54 a day. Nina Armilio will tell us why. Known for its picturesque mountains, centuries-old alpine houses, and idyllic alleyways, the town of Hallstatt in Austria is the perfect place to snap selfies and spend time to appreciate the wonders of creation. Hallstatt was listed as a World Heritage Center by UNESCO in 1997 and is regularly heralded as one of the most beautiful towns in the world. Tourists travel from all over the world to visit the town, some from as far away as China, South Korea, Australia, and the United States. But mass tourism is starting to take toll on Hallstatt residents. The population of the town is just a little bit over 700, but visitors average between 8,000 and 9,000 a day because of the apparent over-tourism. Alexander Schutz, the mayor, said that the number of buses visiting Hallstatt would be limited to a maximum of 54 per day starting from May 1 this year. Though trying to balance the influx of visitors, Hallstatt is admittedly aware that tourist dollar has become an indispensable part of the town's economy. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this January 10, 2019. On behalf of Angelo Castro III, I'm Alex Baltazar. And before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. We do not want to happen, but might happen, especially in Metro Manila in urban areas, shifting. I yun nga lang, kailangan ko na mas maraming teacher. Dahil dalawang shifting to. Question mark as to how to do it. How do you sell to someone? Carton? No, who's a carton? Diba? Well, we're committed. We're committed to comply as long as there's a way. 
War is never inevitable. It is a matter of choice. And often, it is the product of easy miscalculations. Yung nambabato kasi sa amin, uh, hindi na na-identify. Yung nagkuha ng portalet, kasi nung pinuntahan ng mga kasama namin, nagtatakbuhan na. In fact, mayroon pa nga doon yung iba, yung mga ihi natin yung pinagtatapon. But just the same, restraints was there. At uh, ito mga tolerance talaga din namin. Pero alam mo, hindi ko ma-describe ko anong klaseng mga deboto to. Uh, kung deboto talaga sila. <laughs>